Good afternoon and welcome to Birdland Media Works. I'm your host, Danielle Pai, and today I'm joined by Dr. Roger Landry. Dr. Roger Landry is a preventive medicine physician and author of the award-winning book, Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic Health and Successful Aging. He is also the president of Masterpiece Living, a group of multidiscipline specialists in the field of aging who partner with organizations to empower older adults to maximize their unique potential and challenge the current perceptions of aging. Trained at Tufts University School of Medicine and Harvard University School of Public Health, Dr. Landry was also a flight surgeon in the Air Force for more than 22 years, keeping pilots and other air crew healthy and performing at their best. Dr. Landry retired as a highly decorated full colonel and chief flight surgeon at the Air Force Surgeon General's Office in Washington, D.C., after duty on five continents. Dr. Roger Landry, thank you so much for joining us again today. Well, it's always my pleasure. Dr. Lander, your last interview was so well-received that I wanted to get you back on the show and continue the conversation we started last month. We were discussing aging in America and how ageism remains one of the last unchallenged stereotypes. For those who may be tuning in for the first time, can you briefly recap a bit of what we talked about? In particular, why do you think that prejudice, that is ageism, is still acceptable in our society? Well, surely, Danielle. I I think you've already uh, addressed it in that it's uh, it's it's unchallenged. And so, why is it? Well, if you look at our history as humans, uh, this is a new phenomenon. Uh, historically, older adults were needed and wanted to guide the society because of their wisdom and knowledge. But around the Industrial Revolution, where production began to dominate, older adults couldn't produce. Uh, in the classic sense of the word, uh, wi- widgets and that sort of thing. So we began then to marginalize them. And uh, the marketing industry, with its um, uh, focus on youth, which happened around the 20th century, uh, you know, maybe mid-20th century or so, uh, has had such an effect uh, on our culture uh, and it is a youth-oriented industry, the marketing industry, uh, that has uh, that has continued to propagate this this whole narrative that uh, that all, that aging is mostly about the client. Yet we have research, very powerful research, that has uh, told us one time and time again, actually, that age, how we age depends upon our lifestyle and the choices we make, how much we move, how much we learn, how much we're socially connected, how much we have meaning and purpose. And therefore, uh, it is not inevitable that aging has to be a long, drawn-out, chronic, uh, painful, expensive uh, uh, affair that we uh, right now believe uh, that that it's uh, that that is a given, and I wrote the book "Live Long, Die Short" to uh, to bring that home. And uh, the original research from MacArthur on successful aging, it it all comes out with the same story: how we age depends on us, and it is very possible to be at high levels of function for a longer, longer period of time. That said, so for all of these reasons, uh, this seems to be one of the uh, unchallenged, you could almost call it a a social justice type of topic. Uh, Every other one in the uh, the country has been or is being challenged. African American, racism, uh, sexism, you, you name it, I think more and more we're becoming aware and enlightened and we challenge it. But this one, not so much. Uh, because it's uh, again, we're, it's all ingrained in us that we're going to age, we're going to decline, we're not going to, we're going to lose our memory, we're going to lose our ability to do things, and uh, we're going to be, you know, pains in the butt. You know, <laughs> we're going to be cranky, and uh, that's how it is. Well, uh, that just seems crazy, doesn't it? Yeah. That now that we know that how we age depends on us, and uh, and we. Uh, we can't accept this, and we shouldn't accept it. Not only before the the maybe a little bit of embarrassment or the humiliation that can come from it, but because it is very destructive. Uh, much of how we age, since it's lifestyle, uh, our expectation has a lot to do with that. So if we have low expectations, that's probably what's going to happen. So this can be very dangerous. And you know, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. To me, ageism is very self defeating. You know, when we're young, we may not be concerned about what our health's going to be like 25 years from now or how we'll plan for our future retirement. And when we're older, we feel like, oh, well, we're past the point of starting a career or we chalk up an injury to age and think, ah, there's nothing I can do about it. And you touched on it a little, but how does that mindset of being too old or too young affect us? 
It's a very powerful uh, determiner of what happens to us. Um, many of us have anecdotally experienced that in life that to the extent that we had low expectations, maybe that's what happened or we saw it with others. I think a great one is the uh, the story of the four-minute mile. Mm-hmm. You know, for, for a time, uh, scientists were absolutely sure that the human could not run a four-minute mile, anything under a four-minute mile. And they had all the science to back it up, and it, and it never did happen. And then one day, Roger Bannister did it. <laughs> and within weeks, more people did it, in months, and now it's a common experience. Uh, and so, and Ellen Langer, a researcher at Harvard, uh, has uh, shown us with her research, fabulous, interesting research, that to the extent we expect something to happen, the brain and the body attempt to make it real, certainly within reason. I mean, I'm not going to uh, swim the English Channel tomorrow uh, or, or run a four-minute mile uh, because I'm, I say I want to. But within reason, to the extent we expect that something can and uh, we want it to happen, that again, we begin to program ourselves to make that happen. And some remarkable things happen uh, when we do that. So this can be a very limiting and dangerous um, uh, idea that we are limited because we're too young to do something or we're too old to do something. Again, it all has to be rational. But I think we are a long way from being close to the reality on this topic. So I say challenge it. And and you struck on something about language and how we not only talk about it, but how we think about our aging. So, you know, I hear a lot of people after age 40, when they forget something, they're They'll say, I'm getting too old, or my memory isn't what I used to be, you know, what it used to be. Or they'll receive an injury. Now, you know, a five-year-old falls down, gets back up again, and and keeps going. You know, we get an injury when we're older, and we say, oh, getting old sucks. And we kind of get this mindset that we're not going to get better. And from what you're saying, that's a really dangerous place to be. It is, because it'll probably be self-fulfilling. I think we see this with the term senior moment. I mean, everybody has those moments where they forget where their keys are or forget why they went into a room. Adolescents have those, but they don't put any consequence to it. We, uh, as we age, begin to and call it a senior moment, Mm -hmm. thinking that our brain function and cognitive ability is uh, is declining. And again, uh, to the extent we believe that, that's probably, uh, you know, what we're shooting for, and that's probably what we're going to be uh, seeing. Now, when older adults say um, laugh at themselves or they, uh, they, may, they may make a comment like that, sometimes it's just dark humor. Uh, you know, we see it a lot in medicine to deal with the horror that we can see in emergency rooms that sometimes in, in behind closed doors uh, we laugh. And uh, you see it in many dangerous occupations. It's a, just a way to deal with it. However, uh, that's okay. But again, it can be limiting to the extent we believe it. And, and it can be cruel and very destructive when targeted to someone else. So that it, to the extent that even if it's a family member, dad, I don't want you doing that. You're too old to do that. Right. Um, you know, why would you think of, uh, of, of skydiving? You know, right. uh, why would you do anything like that or or even something even less demanding? And so, um, uh, again, this this kind of talk has a way of becoming self-fulfilling. And therefore, since we know that lifestyle and our choices determine how we age, this can be very uh, destructive. And you know what? After this calls over, I'm going to write four minute mile somewhere and just hang it up so that every time I feel like I can't do something, I'm just going to remember that that key story, four minute mile. <laughs> just to have There it. you go. It's a marvelous, inspiring story. And uh, hell, uh, high schoolers uh, run the four minute mile now. And I, I think we're, I'm not sure exactly, but we're at least about maybe 12 seconds below the four minute mile for uh, some of our fast runners. Wow. It's amazing. Now, what really struck me about Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic Health and Successful Aging is that the principles you discuss can be applied to any age group, not just older adults. Uh, In fact, I recently read a study that while Alzheimer's is often diagnosed with somebody between the ages of 60 and 70 years old, the disease actually begins to develop as much as 25 years prior to that. So given that knowledge, what should people in their 30s and 40s do now to reduce the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's or dementia in the future? 
Well, Alzheimer's and dementia is is a, is, a, is an excellent disease to talk about the the entire topic of chronic disease. Chronic disease is what tends to get us now, uh, since uh, our developments in medicine have taken away uh, at least limited trauma and limited infectious disease, so it's chronic disease. And this chronic disease is probably one of the most uh, troubling, and uh, it's predicted alone uh, without any new discoveries, which I think will will come. I'm very optimistic about it. But if not, then within 25 years, this alone would break Medicare, this disease alone. So it's very important. So what we have learned, and again, we should be probably talking about this in kindergarten now, because this is remarkable things about how our lifestyle and our choices really determine how we're going to age and what diseases we're probably going to experience. With this particular disease, Alzheimer's and dementia, as you know, with brain scans, we've learned more. Before, we only knew someone had it. You know, we suspected it during their lifetime with their, with their forgetfulness or, or how they were behaving, but we never knew for sure until an autopsy. But now we have ways uh, with brain scans and others to, to know the disease is going on, and we have, um, we've been able to demonstrate a, a gene for early onset dementia or Alzheimer's disease, uh, but as yet, we haven't been able to cure it. We haven't been able to prevent it, but what we have been able to do, because we're able to track people over long prospective studies, uh, that certain lifestyles are associated with a less likelihood of developing the symptoms, and if you develop the disease, that the disease tends to uh, uh, from a data analysis point of view, occur later than it would have before. You know, we're never sure, but statistically it does. So just things, simple things like moving, physical, being physical, having good cardiovascular health, so taking care of your blood pressure, lipids, your weight, uh, making sure that you have a diet or a lifestyle that results in prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. Uh, that this is a huge factor, that how much we challenge our brains and learn new things, no matter what our age. Um, in 20s, of course, we are learning new things, 30s and 40s, but as we get older, we tend to learn fewer new things, and this may very well alone be associated with a lot of the incidents and of uh, dementia and uh, Alzheimer's. So that keep learning, keep learning new things, uh, being uh, the, all the other life, uh, healthy lifestyle characteristics, being socially connected, challenging our brains with conversation and with uh, laughter and uh, connecting with each other and our diet. Uh, we have diets that certainly when we are obese, we're much more likely to uh, suffer from diabetes. And, and lastly, a very optimistic study from the nun study that I think we mentioned, may have mentioned last time, but these nuns, they followed over a long period of time because they uh, they were looking at many variables and it was a good population. And when some of them died at autopsy, they were shown to have the brains of Alzheimer with tangles and plaques, and yet they didn't have any of the associated symptoms or signs of dementia. And they the researchers attributed this to their lifestyle, one of being very physically active, very cognitively active and adventurous, learning new things, and uh, certainly being socially connected. So again, we're down to these, these very basic lifestyle characteristics, which uh, have been common to us as a species uh, since we began to walk the earth. And uh, in our high-tech society, our frenetic society, our different society, we're moving away from it. And, and again, to the extent that we expect we can't do these things because we're older, well, we're probably going to suffer the consequences of not doing these things. Yeah. So it's an optimistic time, but it's one where we have to realize that, uh, that we're in charge. It's really up to us. And you brought up something really interesting with the nun study because they had this rigorous intellectual routine throughout the course of their lifestyle. But in our culture, you know, when you think about it, you have kids, they go through elementary school and then high school and then college, and then you're done. There's not as much focus on continued education and continued growth. And it sounds like that's the key to maintaining high cognitive functions in later life. 
That's that's very true, Danielle. And and a lot of uh, what we do later in life is passive. Mm -hmm. So TV, uh, even you know social media to some extent, a lot of it is passive rather than uh, a very very active. Namely, learning something. Reading tends to be an active. Mm -hmm. thing. Uh, certainly learning new things is an act of things. And, and this is associated on brain scans with growth in the brain. Uh, so new neuropathways and those neuropathways are very healthy and seem to be part of the reason why we, uh, the nuns and why we with a lifestyle, even if we had the disease, could delay the onset of the symptoms of this disease. So, yeah. again, very optimistic uh, research, very optimistic news. We just have to know about it and uh, and and living the life that is associated with uh, living longer and successful aging and living long and dying short. It's not difficult. It's just being aware and keeping at it and not letting someone else tell you what you can and cannot do. Yeah, and and it's not like the New Year's resolution where you do it for three months and then let it go. It's just a continued oh, habit. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for saying that. You know, in the book, I talk about kaitsen, and that is a Japanese approach to change, which is the what is the smallest step I can take towards being better or whatever I want. And that is your goal, and that's what you strive for. Taking the big goal, we always tend to fail, and therefore, by February, New Year's resolutions are usually gone. But taking a small goal uh, that and doing that and then – adding a little bit more to it and a little bit more. It may take a little longer, but we get where we need to go. Yeah. And I want to make sure that we, we don't have time to cover all 10 tips in your book, but I'm going to be particular about my personal favorites because there are four that I love. You talk about mindfulness. You talk about finding meaning and purpose. You talk about laughing more and never acting your age. So if we could just take a few minutes and break those down. In the book you write, Wherever You Are, Be There, what do you mean by that? You know, it seems a little bizarre when you hear the words, when you read the words, but if you really pay attention, and this is the problem, that whenever you're someplace, there is so much that you uh, are not aware of because usually your mind is someone else. The Buddhists call it monkey mind. I think we're the only species that has the ability to to do this, to be having, be thinking of the future, thinking of the past, thinking of uh, whatever, whatever kind of thoughts, and not being where you are right now, noticing what is near you, noticing the colors, the smells, the touches. Uh, you know, we can only live our life in the present. I'll repeat that. We can only live our life in the present. If we spend our that present moment thinking of the future or worrying about the past or worrying about the future or angry about the past or whatever, we're missing our life. We're missing the present moment. And, you know, I, I love to ask when I'm speaking artists uh, who paint, I said, uh, how do you, uh, f uh, what happens to time when you're painting? And they say there is no time. And, you know, Danielle, you cannot be stressed or, you, you know, you, you are mindful, much more likely to be mindful if you are not consumed with time if you are if there's no sense of time so that you are so fully in the moment that time doesn't matter and then I ask them well how do you feel then and I get everything from peaceful happy joyful even because and we've all experienced it when you are in the moment it is it is how our life is meant to live. It, we, we cannot do that, of course. We cannot. We have, uh, we're humans and our, we're, the way we're wired, it's not going to happen. But we must take even just seconds, but certain periods of the day. You know, meditation is meant for this. But even things like doing Sudokus or painting or carpentry or knitting or, or, or whatever – uh, that forces you into a moment, into a place where there is no time, and you are there in the present. So you're there, and you're really there. I mean, how many times have we gone through the day, drove and driven miles, or uh, been in a room and not 
remember anything yeah. uh, from that room, not remembered what picture was on the wall or noticed what picture was on the wall or what we passed as we were driving. This, unfortunately, is how most of us live our lives, and that is associated with a huge amount of stress, a huge amount of associated chronic disease through this whole process of stress. And uh, it also uh, it, it, it hurts relationships. It hurts our quality of life. So even if it's just for seconds and meditation is a great place to begin with this. And even if you just meditate and be in the moment for seconds uh, and, and, and kites in it up to minutes or whatever, uh, that's a beginning. And that sort of reboots us and uh, into being more mindful yeah. how we eat. You know, we, we tend to just eat and uh, not really pay attention to the taste, not savor it. Uh, and uh, again, this is a this is a sorrowful way, and it's getting uh, tends to be worse with uh, the pace of our society. So this was a good one to ask Danielle, and I appreciate you asking it. And you you left us with a really good mindfulness exercise, even taking five minutes to walk into a room and go through our senses. What do you see? What do you smell? What do you taste? And if you do that for five minutes, it's forcing you to kind of shut your past and your future out and to be fully present. So that's a great takeaway. Absolutely. You know, we, we tend to live our lives that five minutes seems like a long time. How can we spare five minutes? Now, that is just crazy. And certainly it's crazy relative to the quality of our lives. At the end of our day, we're exhausted. Uh, we don't remember any major, peaceful, pleasurable, mindful, timeless moments. And uh, is that how we want to live? And, you know, I've been at the deathbed of a lot of people. And I, I've never heard anyone say, wish I had, you know, uh, raced around more or made more or uh, accomplished things. No, it's, it's usually about people, about relationships, about meaningful moments when they were mindful and there and at, at very present. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you say you mentioned people don't have five minutes to stop, but I guarantee you if they added up all the time they spent agonizing over something that happened that made them angry or worrying about the future, I'm pretty sure it's going to add up to a lot more than five minutes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you become more, as you know, you're, you're I know you do much meditation and as I do, but you become more effective, efficient. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 many of the creative minds, Einstein uh, and others, uh, said that their creative moments usually came when they stopped thinking. Yeah. You yeah. know, it seems counterintuitive, but they would stop thinking, be in the moment, and when they engage their mind again as a tool, which is what it's meant to be, not to rule the roost and, 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 and uh, have us running around this mind track and monkey mind, uh, but it's used as a tool. When they engaged it again, that was their moment of creativity. You talk about finding your purpose, and it kind of relates to creativity. Why is meaning and purpose so important to healthy lifestyles? Uh, we are finding – well, you know, think of, think of this, and I think your young listeners, I think, should particularly uh, do this. Can you imagine life, and it's, it's a long way from someone who's young and not so long and someone who's older. Think of a, of a time when you would wake up and you had absolutely nothing to do all day. No one who was uh, depending on you, no one who was expecting to hear from you, no one who was going to visit you. Now, for someone who's very busy with kids and running around, say, oh, heaven. Yes, perhaps for a day, maybe even two. <laughs> but think of the rest of your life that way. How lonely, but it, this is incredibly destructive. It, it, it saps the will to exist, it, it saps. We as humans are are meant to have purpose. It, it's what gets us out of bed. It's what gives us our sense of confidence, competence, and self esteem. The poet Mary Oliver has a great line in one of her poems: "And tell me what it is you plan to do with your one wild and precious life." That is, a, I love, I love that quote. Although every it's, time I hear it, I think, all right, I'm not crazy enough. I got to do more. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great challenge. And it's not just for young people. I think uh, older adults tend to think that it is uh, for a young person. And no, it's for all of us. I think as long as we have a pulse, 
we need purpose or, or we wither. And uh, without it, uh, again, it is, uh, it is not only lonely and, and sort of sorrowful very well, it is destructive. Once again, I, that word I'm using a lot, but in fact, it, it is. It, is uh, it sucks our energies, it sucks optimism, and with it, our, uh, our immune system suffers and we are much more likely to suffer actual disease uh, when we are without purpose. And so it is. it has risen into the spotlight as one of the major lifestyle characteristics that's absolutely necessary to age well. Yeah. And purpose, I mean, it doesn't have to be career, but it could be tied to a career. You know, my parents, grandparents, great parent, grandparents, they had one major career from the time they began working to the time they retired. And yet when I was in high school, I was told that my generation would have an average of five careers, not jobs, but careers within a lifetime. But now I fast forward today and I hear people in my age group, and I'm 45, and they have this belief that they're too old to start a new career. What would you say to that? Well, I think uh, your listeners would probably predict what I would say. <laughs> uh, you know, society uh, and uh, technology and, and the rate of change, of change, is huge, and that's certainly a problem, but it is reality. So to think that uh, your life of, uh, with a little help, some lifestyle, paying attention to these things, the ability to live well into your 80s and 90s and even beyond is very high. So to, to think of living 70, uh, seven, eight, nine decades uh, doing the same thing, that's okay, but only that thing, yeah. that, uh, that, that's, uh, I think that's planned obsolescence, actually. And, uh, you know, so that uh, I think with a rapidly changing world, there's, uh, the, there's the stimulus for us to consider other things. And if we're going to continue to grow, which is very important to aging successfully and to learn new things, as we mentioned, also very important to age in a better way. I think that it is uh, inevitable that uh, we will indeed go down paths that we never thought. I, I know my career is never what I thought it was going to be, and it has, uh, and it has wiggled and changed and spun off in directions I never, yeah. never would have thought, and uh, and are just thrilled uh, with what's uh, what's happened with. Them. And it is. I think it is important uh, since we mentioned this, particularly for your older listeners that, well, even for the younger ones, because the rate of change of the technology development is so fast that even a 30-year-old can start to say, I can't keep up. And I'm not saying that we keep up with every new thing that comes down, but I think particularly for older adults now, it is very important that we be uh, cogn be, be aware and be uh, at least able to, uh, a, I almost say in a primitive sense, but to be able to use technology because to not do that is, again, as I said, uh, becoming obsolete is becoming functionally illiterate. So, and it's, it's the ability to learn new things and it's the ability to stay connected to society. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, older adults, and I'm probably one of them, think that there's a, a dark side to the technology as well as a good side. And I could be critical of that, but that doesn't mean that uh, I, I, I should eschew it, that I shouldn't use it. Because to do that, again, would may, would marginalize me and therefore put me at higher risk for bad things happening. Yeah, and you touched on another stereotype that older people can't learn new technology. And it, it surprises me every time that people talk to me and they don't know my age when I work with, with clients and they think I'm a millennial or they think I'm in my you know early 20s because I stay up on technology and they're shocked when they hear my age and they shouldn't be shocked because I feel like everybody, if you're in a career and you're working, you always need to be learning. And so I hope that that stereotype that older adults don't learn or can't learn um, gets squashed pretty soon. <laughs> Well, well said, Danielle. That's why I love working with you. Yeah, in fact, the uh, the older age group, the ninth, tenth decade of life, is the most rapidly growing population for the adoption of technology. Now, that's because they started lower, and and there's be becoming more and more of them. But I'm, I I think that's a telling statistic, um, and I think the boomers are very very open to it. So, you know, and again, it's happening quickly, so that you don't. Yeah, uh, you know, certainly not up on every new thing that comes down the road. I have lived my life 
mostly not as an early adopter. I'm kind of a late adopter, but I adopt. (laughs) (laughs) And I I think that's how most most people are. And I highly encourage them to at least the basics and the the understanding of what these things are so that, again, they they stay engaged in the greater society and be able to talk to their grandkids. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Now, you put laughter up there in the 10 tips, along with physical exercise, staying mentally active, socially connected. On the list of healthy priorities, laughter might not seem to people as a major contributor to a healthy lifestyle. Why is laughter so important? Well, it's fun for one thing. (laughs) Uh, uh, Someone has called it a social connector. And we uh, have discussed in the past, not this time, but the, the very important lifestyle characteristic of being socially connected to others. And to the extent that we become as we said in our last podcast, pasteurized or marginalized in society, bad things happen. Laughter is a social connector. It tends to bind us uh, to others. And this is this has been from day one of humans uh, sitting around a campfire. And it is, uh, it is something now we're learning with the, our new research it, that is associated with stronger immune systems. The famous story of Norman Cousins, uh, who wrote Anatomy of an Illness many decades ago, about how he basically cured a terminal disease by laughter. Mm-hmm. We didn't know why then, but uh, we know now that when someone laughs, uh, they're socially connected, they tend to be more optimistic. The research tells us that optimistic people tend to live about seven and a half years longer. So the half full kind of people, again, they're around longer than the half empty people. And uh, and their immune systems are very, very much stronger. And so that could have been uh, associated with his cure. He died of another disease 30 years after the diagnosis, 30 years after they said he was going to die. And it's fun. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I, there's a great saying, a uh, uh, former comedian after says, laughter is the shortest distance between two people. Uh, mm-hmm. So this, this social connection uh, aspect uh, very important. And uh, again, it draws people to us. You know, as we age, my wife tells me that I shouldn't <laughs> say this in presentations, but I basically tell people that time and gravity take a toll on our face. And uh, it <laughs> tends to, uh, for many people, become a scowl, even though that's not internally what's happening. But our faces are very important in, in how we are viewed and how we non-verbally communicate in the world. And so if there is a scowl there, not a smile or not a laugh, it tends to push people away. And uh, again, we're, we know that that's associated with bad things happening. Yeah, I learned that the hard way having photographs. You know, I was afraid, and this is ageist, I know, but I'm afraid to smile because then you see the crow's feet in the different lines. So I try to look very serious and then it looks like I'm scowling at people. So I learned that lesson by looking at pictures of me and saying, wow, I'm, I wasn't angry, but I look really angry. You know, most of the uh, the famous photographers and painters uh, love subjects who are older because they, uh, they see in that face uh, a history, a story, yeah. uh, humanity. Uh, young faces are beautiful, but they're they're as yet sort of like a blank canvas, and uh, and so the the the, the real uh, I've said humanity, but the substance and the gravitas of our journey here is uh, oftentimes written on our face, much to the chagrin of some people. But um, the fact is, uh, people who uh, appreciate art and uh, and something substantial. Um, they tend to think that this is a gift. That's, a, that's beautifully said, you know, that everyone's face tells a story. It has their history mm. written on it. So. That's, that's what I use for an excuse for all my lines. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my favorite tip, my favorite tip, never act your age. And I can safely say there's no danger of me ever doing that. But perhaps right. we should differentiate between childish versus childlike. <laughs> Why should someone never act their age? Well, I hope you do continue to... To have that as a major characteristic, Danielle. Uh, as children, we were told to act our age uh, because we usually were acting childish and, uh, you know, silly and whatever. And that's okay as a child. 
But what this one is about is uh, to never be constrained by the uh, low expectations we were talking about before associated with age. You know, last time I told the story of Chuck Yeager and uh, when he said he was going to break the sound barrier again at, at 50 years uh, anniversary and I told him he'd be 73, I mean, I was uh, forcing upon him my low expectations of, of a chronological name, a, a number. Yeah. We should make chronological age irrelevant. This is Masterpiece Living's goal. You know, you and I both work with a great team and with Masterpiece Living. Make chronological age irrelevant. And uh, the way to do that, I think, is to, to, first of all, not let perhaps things you've learned along the way, the ageism that we were talking about, become entrenched in you so that you have this negative talk. Oh, I can't do that or I shouldn't do that or that's not seemly or what would people say or, uh, you know, oh, I'm not sure. And and think about it and say, OK, maybe I can do this. Maybe I'll have to make some accommodations like Maybe you always want to swing the uh, swim the English Channel. Well, maybe at 85 you're not going to do it. You know, maybe you could, but uh, but it, you could do it. Maybe swinging swimming a lap at a time over months. You know, so that's that sort of thing. So mm-hmm. accommodate, uh, and uh, and that's your self talk. But also don't let society or even those close to you, your family. Uh, burden you with their low expectations. Uh, I once had a, f- a man come up to me after a presentation and said his mother had just celebrated her 90th birthday and they had a party in the backyard and she was late and they were worried and all of a sudden they saw her come down in a parachute. <laughs> I love uh, it. <laughs> she had never asked her children if she should do that because what <laughs> they would probably they would have said, said? no. <laughs> You know, so sometimes out of love and for good reasons, people can put uh, the burden of low expectations upon us. So uh, never acting your age is about realizing that your life is yours, that your uh, aging journey is determined by your choices and what you do, and that as long as you have a pulse, you can continue to grow and try new things and connect to others and have a purpose and keep moving. So I want to let everyone know they can get a copy of Live Long, Die Short, A Guide to Authentic Health and Successful Aging by visiting www.livelongdieshort.com. Dr. Roger Landry, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Always fun, Danielle. Anytime.